Today we're going to be talking about possibilities in poetry. So one possibility in poetry involves the type of poem that you can write. So today we're first going to look at what are genres. So a genre is a type and we'll get more into that. And then I'm going to explain to you two contemporary genres. I'm going to give a demonstration and workshop on a found poem and how you can create one, and I hope that you'll create one along with me today. And then I'm going to explain three traditional genres. And in conclusion, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the writing process, which is so important in every type of writing. Okay, so to start, what are genres? So genres are types of poems. Forms are different from genres. So when someone talks about a poem's form or poetic form, they are talking about the poem's shape. And so forms include specific patterns and sets of rules. So some forms, maybe you've heard of and maybe not, um, include the villanelle, the sonnet, the sestina, and the pantoum. So how can knowing about genres help us to write more poetry? Because when we talk about forms, those are a little bit intimidating. There are a lot of rules, like you have to have iambic pentameter, certain type of rhyming, certain number of lines, but genres are not like that. So genres are like similar to when you tell someone what kind of music you like or what kind of movies you want to go see or what kind of novels you like to read. So maybe you like to read fantasy novels, so that would be the genre. Well, poems have genres too. Um, and they help us to write more poetry because you need to understand that poems are not just collections of feelings on a page. So there's a big misunderstanding out there that poetry is all about feelings and that's it. Well, that's just frankly not true. Poems can be about anything. And in addition to that, they are not just specific forms that we have to follow. So poems do not have to rhyme. They do not have to have a certain number of lines. There are many possibilities in poetry. So what poets do is they take their ideas and then they choose a genre, so a type, and then they choose a form. So I have an idea that I want to write a poem about something and then I decide what type of poem am I going to write and what form do I want to put it in. And I want to let you know that I'm not going to be teaching you about forms today, but free verse is a form. So free verse it, um, includes those types of poems that don't follow rules, that don't have to rhyme. Basically, it can be um, anything that you want. Okay, so we're going to discuss um, two different categories of genres. So contemporary genres and traditional genres. So when I say contemporary jo genres, those are genres that are written today and that have been invented relatively recently. Um, and traditional genres are very, very old. So poetry is actually the oldest type um, of literature. So when I speak about traditional genres, some of these were invented thousands of years ago, so it's pretty interesting. But the contemporary ones that we'll begin with, those were written nearer to today. So we're going to be looking at the two contemporary genres, found poetry and blackout poetry. And then the traditional genres, persona poetry, the ode, and ekphrastic poetry. So to begin, we're going to look at those two contemporary genres, blackout poetry and found poetry. And I hope today that you will create a found poem with me. Okay, so blackout poetry. What is that? Blackout poetry, or they're also known as erasures, they are created by taking any text sample and erasing or removing words. The poem is created from what remains on the page. So here's an example of a blackout poem. Um, this one's by Carol R. Ward, and you can see that the poem is created by what remains. And she's just taken a marker and she's removed everything else. And so these can be created from any text um, that you choose. Sometimes po poets will choose a text that relates in some way to the subject matter, but other times they just create these for fun. So maybe if you're not feeling inspired, you don't have an idea of something you want to write a poem about, you can get any text and aim to create 
a blackout poem as sort of a challenge, and you'll be surprised what you come up with and what you see in the text. So found poetry. Found poetry is poetry that is created entirely or at least in part from text the poet finds. So text that the poet discovers in some way. So in this way, we're not taking text that we um, that we find and we're not removing um, pieces to create a poem, but we're taking the found poem and making a poem out of it using all of it or part of it. So it can be derived from literary, literally anywhere and is accredited in the poem's title or epigraph. So the epigraph is that little piece of information that comes after a poem. And so I will put some reference either in the title or there telling my reader where the original um, text came from. So here's an example of a very famous um, modernist found poem by William Carlos Williams. And so... Um, if you look, um, this is the poem in its entirety, and it could have been a found note. And so the poem is titled, This is Just to Say, and the title leads into the first line of the poem. So um, read it along with me. It says, this is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious, so sweet and so cold. So as you can see, that poem is not about feelings. Um, it is about something very specific. It's an apology of sorts. And William Carlos Williams was an imagist poet, poet, so he aimed to create an image in the reader's mind. That was his main objective. And so here he uses those adjectives describing the plums um, that he, well, you know, took from somebody else. But that's a found poem because that would be like a note that someone found and created a poem out of it. So now um, we're going to have our demonstration and workshop. So we're not going to do this for all of the genres, but I wanted you to have the chance to write a poem today, and you can write one, a found poem. So for part of for this part of the presentation, you might need to pause it um, as you complete part of the steps for creating your poem. You will need a notebook, like something to write with, um, or a computer to type um, your poem. Okay, so the point of this is to understand that poetic inspiration is everywhere. So this is the art of finding poems. So how do we find or discover poems out in the world when we don't know in our mind what we want to write about? So we know we want to write. We feel like writing. We want um, to participate in something creative. We think it's fun. So maybe this is a good challenge for that. So for this, you're actually going to need your phone. So um, if you don't have a phone, or you're in a place where you can't use your phone, like at school, um, you can take a book or any form of text. So the idea of this is we want to find random pieces of text and we want to put them together. So I'll give you some other options. But for this demonstration, you need your phone, if you get text messages, or your parent's phone, somebody's phone, um, or a book. So if you don't have a phone, what you will do is use a book and open to the to five random pages. So if you've ever played that game where you open a book to a random page and then see what, what you find, um, I want you to do that when I ask you to look at the phone. So otherwise, we are going to need our phone and our text messages, okay? Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. So step one is you have to get out your phone. All right, so you're gonna get out your phone and then you are going to look at the last messages you've received and that are visible on a single screen without scrolling. So you're going to go to your messages and you're not gonna open a single message. You're just gonna look at like the list of messages. Um, the idea is that the phone previews a piece of each message, right? The beginning. And can we find a poem in those words that are there randomly from people that we know? So what you want to do is then screenshot the image. So screenshot the image that just has the first lines of those text messages. From the screenshot, then you will copy the portions of the text messages that are visible without scrolling in the order that you appear. So what you have just written down then on your paper 
is the draft of a found poem. So that's the draft. And sometimes you can leave it as it is, and the effect is humorous, um, unexpected, um, whimsical, strange even sometimes. Um, other times it works. Sometimes you do have to change the lines around, or you can use that as a starting place to inspire a poem. So maybe only one line will be one that you end up keeping. So here's an example just to show you how this could work. So here's an example that's a text message poem draft. So somebody's um, screen and they have um, these four text messages. So is there a Midnight Hunger Games, Games planned? Attachment, one image, of course, and haha, I'm on the bobsled team for sure. So that's very random, right? And so the thing is, is um, when people are writing comedy, one of the things that's funny is being random. It's actually called a non sequitur. It's okay if you don't know what that means. But um, it has this humorous effect because it's just kind of strange and unexpected. And so the beauty of a found poem is it can often have that effect because it's found and it's not created linearly, it can be funny. So let's take a look then. So what I decided to do with this text message poem is to revise it. And so we're going to talk about the writing process at the end, but revision is a really important aspect of the writing process. In my opinion, as a writer, as a poet myself, revision is the most important part. So I teach writing as well, and I've seen that if students understand that they can revise and that writing is a process, then their writing just gets better and better because they're not as stressed out about it if it's not perfect or how they want it to be the first time because they know they can keep changing it. And that's that's okay. But so what do we do in revision? In revision, and to revise means to re-see. It means to see the writing again. So whatever you wrote, you're going to go to the top and read it from the very beginning and read it to the very end and see it again. And I don't mean for fixing the errors. That's something different. We're not fixing the spelling. We're revising. We're seeing the content differently. And so what we want to do in revision is we add where we need to add more. We take away where something doesn't work. In the poem, we will create line breaks. So I might move the words around and rearrange. So in the poem, I'm going to rearrange pieces, add to, and take away. So if you look at mine, I'll read it to you, and then I'll talk to you about what I did. So I gave it a title. It's called Miscommunication After My Text Messages. Is there a Midnight Hunger Games planned? You laughed. I'm on the bobsled team for sure. One image attachment, I must have missed you listening, for sure. Okay, so this is kind of like a riddle, and it's um, really a poem that's just speaking to this idea that text messaging, it's not a great way of communicating. Like, how many times have, have you gotten into an argument with somebody over text message or people un misunderstood you? And if you don't have a phone and you don't text, you could ask someone, your family, about it, and they know exactly what I'm talking about, because it's just really easy to misunderstand people in this way. So what did I do to make this little poem about miscommunication? Well, I gave it a title. And like I said, that the poet usually gives credit to the found text somewhere in the title or the epigraph. So I added that in what's called the epigraph. So right there under my title, which I titled it miscommunication to tell my reader what it's about. The epigraph says after my text messages. So that means I found this in my text messages. So you can see that I moved around the texts themselves from the order that I screenshotted them a little bit. So I started with the same um, with the same opening line. I thought that was pretty interesting to begin with, and I um, gave it a question mark, um, and then I added in the dialogue. So um, where it says "ha ha," I didn't really like that, so I wanted to change that. So I changed it to "you laughed." Um, and then where it says attachment one image, I just moved that around. I said one image attachment. Um, I must have missed you listening. So I added in those, I must have missed you listening. And then um, I repeated because repetition is something that poets use for effect. So poetic effect. So I repeated that for sure. Um, okay. So these can be um, much longer. They can, um, you can spend a lot more time on them, but this is just one example how you can create a poem 
out of text that you find out in the world, including your text messages. So I hope you were able to come up with a poem. Remember, if you don't have a phone, the idea was to do the same thing, but with lines you randomly open to in a book. So I would flip through the book and say I stop on page 25 in the first line. What is that? I write it down. And I do the same thing four more times. And then I have five lines, and I see if I can make a poem out of them. And that is a found poem. Okay. So here are some examples of some, just a few of the possibilities for found text. So where else can I find poems? So um, um, I've seen poems written about graffiti. So there's a famous one by the poet Art Smith that says, uh, please come back or send somebody. It's a wonderful poem, but it stems from he was on a, on a bus and he saw that graffiti spray painted um, on, um, on some plywood on a house. And obviously that implies something mysterious happened there. So he made a poem out of it. Um, movie scripts, laws, a Facebook feed. So using people's Facebook posts, um, rights like Miranda writes, uh, vows like wedding vows, existing poems and prose, fictions, news articles, encyclopedia entries, historical accounts, um, death certificates, coroner's reports, court transcripts. A lot of poets have used those to make some kind of political or historical commentary. Um, billboards, lists of supplies, letters, emails, found notes. So a lot of poets, if they find like a, a grocery list, they'll, they'll pick it up um, and they'll make a poem out of it. Um, lists of supplies. Uh, I already said that one, excuse me. So speeches, text messages, like we talked about, directions, recipes, and even radio broadcasts, transcripts. So remember, it's not a poem if you just take someone else's text and just put it without giving it any line breaks or any sort of different title or something like that or moving things around or you have to find it in some way. So if I find it completed and I don't do anything to it. It's not my poem yet. I have to revise it in some way. And um, like I said, sometimes the when you screenshot, the text messages will work as they are and you don't have to change them, but that's still found because you pieced together these little messages that came through. It wasn't someone else who wrote it all in that order because that would be plagiarism. That's not the same thing as a found poem, which is why I remember we give it credit to tell the reader where we found it. Okay. All right, so some revision strategies and uh, for the found poem specifically. So after you find the text, um, the first one is you can, you can break the lines, turning prose into poetry. So the word prose means any writing in paragraph form. So any type of writing that's in a paragraph is prose. I can break lines and then it becomes a poem. You can embed the entire found text um, and italicize the found portions of the text. So that means I'm going to take the whole text and I'm going to write text around it, but the found text I put in italics on the computer to show my reader that that's something someone else said. You can remix, cut, move around pieces like I showed you. You can have two or more texts speak back to each other. So some uh, poets will take an interview transcript from one historical person and the interview transcript from another and they put them side by side like a mirror. And so you have a dialogue of people talking to each other that the poet invented because the dialogue never occurred in real life. Um, and they found the dialogue, but then they put it together, they revised it to make it their poem. You can embed one text that provokes an argument in you and disagree with it. You can create a collage of all different types of texts all put together for a surreal effect. And then you can cross out portions of the text the, um, using erasure. So that would just be a line out. That would not be the same as creating a blackout poem where the entire strategy is blacking out words. This would just be a few that you put lines through in order to make a statement um, about something that um, you wanted to remove, but you want the reader to still see the text. So in a blackout poem, when you cross out the words, you can't see them anymore. They are blacked out. But in, an, in, in this um, erasure, strategy you just put a line through it so you can still see it okay so the form for your final draft so if we move through the writing process and I very quickly took you through um, the pre-writing where you found the text and then um, the drafting 
is the same as the pre-writing pretty much for the found text because the text is um, exists in at once. The only difference is is that in the pre-writing for a found poem, you have the idea. So where are you going to find your text? Is it from the phone text messages or from a book or somewhere else? And then revision, we moved everything around, but then um, you have to edit. So that is when you look for the errors and put that into a final draft. So the form for your final draft of your found poem, you want to first have a title. And then after the title, you want to include the following in a smaller font. So after blank. So the ex my example was after my text messages. All right. Or you could be you could say after five science books. And then you type your poem. If only a portion of your poem is the found text, italicize those words. So if it's only like a single line, a little bit of it, then you would just draw some attention to those words specifically. But if it's mostly a found text, you don't have to do that. Okay, so the conclusion on found poetry. Um, so closing up the workshop part. So, um, and then we're going to get into some more possibilities in poetry. But it's important to remember that poetry is not just your feelings, okay? So it's great when poetry can include feelings, but poetry is a lot more than feelings. And like I said, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. People think that poets are all sad and dramatic all the time, and they only write about their feelings. Poets write about all kinds of things. And so um, it's also not just emotion captured. Similar to songs and music, it can be a wonderful way to capture emotion, but it's more than that. It's also not just your past recollected, so poetry is not always memories, but it can be. So found text that you reshape is still a poem. And found poetry is about what all poetry is about, and that's the language itself, what you are doing with the words. So language is borrowed from your environment and processed when you create a found poem. But the processor is you. And once processed, the found text takes on a new meaning, and that's your meaning. So the text becomes something new, and we could call it then it becomes an art object. And that art object is a found poem. Okay. So that moves on from our, we're going to move on from our workshop. So I hope that you were able to create a found poem today, or at least start one, or get inspired. Um, and I hope that you will notice language out in the world. So next time you see something that's interesting, like something sprayed in graffiti or a note on the floor in the grocery store, um, or even a note that you find um, on the ground, if look and pay attention to the language around you and ask yourself what you can do with it and if it's speaking to you at all um, and that might help unlock um, a creative um, door for you um, that you can enter and then create something new and have a good experience with it and have a poem okay so now i'm going to talk about traditional genres so we're not going to write these together but Remember, at the very beginning, I said my goal was for you to have a lot of different types of poems that you can write. So you know that poems are more than just feelings. They don't have to be personal, but they can be. Um, and that they're not just about your history. So we talked about already making a blackout poem and we made a found poem together. And now we're going to look at three traditional genres. So like I said, traditional, um, in this sense, these, these genres are very old. So they've been around for a long time. Poets wrote them thousands of years ago, and poets are still writing them today. So that's pretty interesting um, that we can be connected to people who were um, creating poetry um, so long ago. All right, so the first one I want to tell you about is persona poetry. So persona poetry, the first thing to know about this is persona, the word, it's a Greek word and it means a mask. So um, when you're encountering a new word, you need to ask yourself, what is it like or where have I seen this before? So it looks like person, right? So it, it's becoming another person. That's what a persona is. So Persona poetry is any poem where the poet writes in the voice of another person taking on their persona. So it would be me as the poet. I'm going to wear a mask 
speaking as someone else who is not me. All right. So this goes into a principle in poetry that many people get wrong. So I already corrected the misconception that poetry is all about feelings. Here's another misconception. When you read a poem and it says I, most people believe that the I is the poet, but that's actually not true. So when we're talking about poetry, the I is the speaker and the speaker can be anyone or anything, even an inanimate object like a rock. True story, okay? So I can speak as anything in a poem, as long as it's clear to my reader. So when you read a poem, you don't need to assume that the I is the poet. So poets write about all kinds of things. They write about some terrible things that they have not experienced. They write about terrible things they have experienced, but, but what I'm saying is, is you need to understand that the I is the speaker of the poem, not the poet. So that can be really freeing for you because you can write a poem and you don't have to talk about your life if you don't want to. So you can write in the voice of anyone. Just make it clear who is speaking in the title or through the poem itself. So here's an excerpt from a persona poem. I wanted you to see an example of each of these three um, traditional genres, just like we looked at the example examples of the two um, contemporary genres. So this is American Journal by Robert Hyden. And this poem is actually in the voice of an alien or several aliens. And this is just an excerpt, which means a piece. But these aliens, they are observing Americans. So obviously Robert Hyden is not an alien, right? So, but he wanted to make commentary about Americans and one of the ways he could do that is by wearing the mask of imagining there's an alien species observing Americans and what would it say about them. So if you look at the first couple of um, stanzas, you can see that Robert Hyden did not use um, the strategy where he tells you who is speaking in the title, but it's clear, okay, it's clear in the first stanza. Let's look at it together. So he says, here among them, the Americans, this baffling multi-people, extremes and variegations, their noise, restlessness, their almost frightening energy, how best describe these aliens in my reports to the counselors? Okay, so first of all, I'm not sure, certain that it's a space alien, but it's different to me that the speaker of this poem is calling an American these aliens. So that tells me the speaker is someone other than the poet. If I know this is an American poet, I'm like, okay, he knows Americans. He is one. So he's talking to someone who is not him. So let's look at um, what he says next. He says in the second stanza, disguise myself in order to study them unobserved, adapting their varied pigmentations, white, black, red, brown, yellow, the imprecise and strangering distinctions by which they live, by which they justify their cruelties to one another. Charming savages, enlightened primitives, brash newcomers, lately sprung up in our galaxy. How describe them? Do they indeed know what or who they are? Do not seem to. Yet, no other beings in the universe make more extravagant claims for their importance and identity. Oh, wow, that's kind of, um, he's a critical. But what I wanted you to see is that in the third stanza of this poem, it is clear that the speaker is a space alien because he says, look at that second line, newcomers lately sprung up in our galaxy how describe them so then i understand as the reader okay so our galaxy he's referring to americans as newcomers so this speaker is a member of the galaxy but not human so as you can see the persona can unfold um, its identity can become clear as we read the poem and as the poem progresses or some poets like i said they'll just put it in the title they they will um they will put the name or they will say a poem in the voice of um they'll they'll put the title of the thing that is talking like if it's a flower there's a famous poem called Trillium by Louise Glick and so it's in the voice of the flower and the poem is titled that um 
you, you don't want to make it confusing to the reader. So poetry can be mysterious, but we don't want to deliberately confuse. And when we're writing persona poetry, it needs to be clear um, who's speaking. So this is just part of one poem. I hope that you'll check um, the whole poem out and look at some more of persona poetry and that maybe you'll try writing one yourself. So let's look at the next traditional genre we're going to talk about today, and it is the ode. So this is an ancient form of poetry, um, and it's a poem of praise. So you can write a poem um, that is an ode praising anything or anyone in life. So the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, he wrote a collection of famous poems called Ode to Common Things, where he praises all kinds of everyday items to call attention to the objects in everyday life we often overlook and take for granted. So in that collection, for example, there's a poem called The Ode um, to an Onion. And so he really gets into describing the onion and its layers and really how amazing it is if you really think about it, that it has all these delicate layers, but it's buried deep into the earth. And so he, he uses a lot of these as metaphors, but if you look at the third bullet point, it says the ode often includes the word ode in the title. So that kind of announces to the reader, this is an ode. So something can be an ode without having it in the title, but to be clear, you should probably just put, put that in the title. Um, I mean, Pablo Neruda did, and he was very famous, so. Okay, so here's an example of a contemporary ode. So Pablo Neruda is a modernist poet, but like I said, um, the ode is an ancient form. Um, so uh, Horace was one of the first, and Pindar were two of the classical poets to, um, to um, invent and um, refine the ode. But let's look at this one. People still write them today. That's what it, I wanted you to see. So this is called Ode to the Electric Fish that Eat Only the Tales of Other Electric Fish um, by Thomas Lux. And it's this is another one of those poems where the title leads into the first line. So Ode to the Electric Fish that Eat Only the Tales of Other Electric Fish, which regenerate their tails and also eat only the tales of other electric eels, presumably smaller, who in turn eat without consulting an ichthyologist eels or fish, I defer to biology's genius. I know little of their numbers and habitat other than that they are river dwellers. Guess which river? I have only a note, a note taken in reading or fever, I can't tell from my handwriting which. All I know is it seems sensible, sustainable. No fish dies, nobody ever gets so hungry he bites off more than a tail. The sting, the trauma, keeps the bitten fish lean and alert. The need to hide while regrowing a tail teaches guile. They'll eat smaller tails for a while. These eels, these eels themselves are odes. So I thought that was really clever. Um, and it's a metaphor for resiliency if you look closely at it. But at its heart, he's just praising this um, incredible feature of um, these eels that he discovered. And so um, it's very much an ode, a poem of praise. The last traditional genre we're going to talk about today is ekphrastic poetry, or what's called ekphrasis. So ek ekphrastic poetry is poetry written about or after a work of art. So it includes um, all types of art, including dance even. I wanted to be clear about that because any, any piece of art that inspires the poet to respond to it or speak back to it in some way can be the subject of ekphrasis. So, the poem title often includes the title of the work of art so the reader can view the art inspiring the poem. And poets say that the poem itself then is in conversation with the artwork that is its subject. So it's one way to, um, to honor works of art that people find interesting or meaningful. So maybe they have um, an artist who means a lot to them and they want to um, engage with that artist's work they can write a poem themselves that um, that speaks back to what the artist did. Um, maybe someone who is deceased now and they can't interact with. So ekphrasis is one way, especially if you like art, if you're really inspired. And you could even um, write an ekphrasis poem responding to music. So any art form. So here's an example. Um, this is an excerpt from an ekphrastic poem. So excerpt, remember, it's just a piece. So um, if you want to check it out, you could look at the rest of it. But um, 
The poem is called Field of Moving Colors Layered, and it's by Tino Villanueva. And it's after the po the painting that I've pictured here above. So this painting is called Untitled 1965 by Alberto Valdez. And so what happened then is the poet Villanueva saw the painting by Valdez and was inspired by it and wanted to speak back to this artist's life. And so sometimes um, the poet will research and find out about the painting itself or the artist's life and they will include those details in their ephrasis. But other times it's just an a response to the artwork itself and what it looks like or what it makes you feel. Um, one other uh, way in which poets write ekphrasis um, is that they will sometimes tell the rest of the story or, or try to like fill in or continue whatever the artist started. So here's um, the excerpt from his poem. He says, I'm not easily mesmerized, but how can you not be drawn in by swirls, angles and whirls brought together to obey a field of moving colors, layered, muted, others bright that make you linger there? Just look at those Carpaccio reds. Right then my mind leaps to Cezanne, his dark blue vest in self-portrait, the seven bathers wallowing in blue, his blue beyond in Chateau Noir. So this has um, multiple paintings cited in it. So it's interesting that although the title of the poem orients the reader and that they understand that this is an ekphrasis in response to this specific painting in the poem itself we learn about other paintings and so um it also helps us learn about art so we can um go and check these other paintings out and see what the poet found so special about them for ourselves okay so to conclude um it's the writing process is crucial, whether you're writing poetry or prose, or whether you're writing an essay for class, or whether you're writing um, a short story, a letter to a friend, a memoir, there's nothing more important. And so I wanted to leave you today with a short explanation of the writing process. So as you are trying out some of these genres and trying out some new types of poetry you may have learned today, um, you can follow these steps and maybe they'll help you out. I hope you'll also follow them out with your writing that you do for school. All right, so the first thing to note is, as I mentioned before, that writing is a process. So um, you may have um, learned about the writing process already. If you're um, older, you probably learned about it a few years ago. If you're a younger student, then maybe it's brand new to you. The thing is about writing being a process is that that means that you can change it. And that's very important to understand because it helps you get through it and finish whatever writing you're working on. Because you need to know it doesn't have to be perfect. You can always go back. Um, and so there are five steps to the writing process and you may have heard them before, but I wanna remind you of what you should be doing during these steps. So the first step is pre-writing. So in pre-writing, we would choose our topic and do any research we need. So for poetry writing, we are inspired to write something and then um, we choose the topic. Then we think about the genre, so the type of poem we want to write, and then maybe even the form. So do we want to write a free verse poem? Do we want to write a rhyming poem? Um, we would decide that in pre-writing. Then we move into the drafting phase. And the second step in drafting, you just write. You do not stop for any reason. You just write. You don't stop if you need to think of a new word. Um, you don't stop if you think that you're not writing um, very well. You don't stop if you can't remember how to spell a word, okay? You can even just draw a little line and save, save a spot for that word you can't think of because then you can go back. The reason for that is uh, relates to a metaphor. So you've probably heard people say before when they're speaking and they forget what they're saying, they'll say, oh, I lost my train of thought. So where does that metaphor come from? Well, it comes from this idea. If you've ever watched a train stop, and I know you, ha you have, or you've heard it, you know how long it takes for a train to stop. And that's why they're so dangerous, because they're so heavy. They have all these cars behind them. So the engine, when it tries to stop, it takes it a moment, but the thing that relates to our point is that once it stops, it's very hard for it to start again. So you know when you see a train stop, 
that it when it starts back up it goes excruciatingly slow and it's pulling all of those carts behind it your train of thought is the same exact way so if you have an idea and you're writing and then you stop you have stopped your train of thought and all of those carts those linked ideas that were filled with those heavy weights all of your good ideas you lost some of them and that's what happens and that's why in drafting you have to just write you have to get all of the ideas out and then we can go back and shape it into something better we do not stop and so when it's an assignment if you stop then you might end up with a zero and that's not good so even if you just write and draft and finish it you're going to get better than a zero but you're going to go back and make it better and and you will get higher than is than than the grade that the draft would have gotten but the point is is that you finished it and that's what you have to do okay so after we finish our draft then we go and we revise revising is not editing people confuse this if revising was the same as editing why would they be two different steps that doesn't make any sense okay so editing I'll get to in a moment, but that's where you correct the errors. Revising is more important actually, and it takes longer. So when I revise, I go to the very top and I read, like I said, and I add to, take away, I rearrange, I substitute where I need a better word. Um, I'm doing all those things to reshape my work to make it better. So I would add to where I need to further develop my points. I would take away where I go off topic or where I repeat myself unnecessarily. So in poetry, we repeat ourselves for an effect, but in other types of writing, I don't wanna to be too repetitive. I don't wanna repeat the same words or repeat the same ideas. And sometimes we do that when we're writing because our brain's trying to think of the best way to say something. So I need to delete, remove, take away, okay? Take away where I repeat myself. Then I need to rearrange. Sometimes things go in a better order and that's why I would rearrange to improve my order, improve my logic, or improve the sound. Um, then I would substitute where maybe my word choice isn't the best. I would change it. I would take those words out and put in different, better ones. Um, and that's revision. And as you can see, that's a lot more complicated. It's not too difficult, but it, it takes more time than editing. The fact of the matter is if you type on your computer, your computer can do your editing for you now. You just do a spell check. And in a newspaper, they have people hired who only check the errors. But those aren't the important editors. The important editors are the copy editors that do all the revision. Okay, so after revision, then we go to the top again. And we read from the very top, looking only for errors. So we don't go back into the other steps. Now, at this point, we look, okay, do I need to fix my spelling? Do I need to add punctuation? Do I need to fix my grammar? Um, and that's editing. And then finally, the last step, which doesn't take very much time, um, but it's, you've probably heard it as the publishing step, but that doesn't make a lot of sense for most students who aren't sending a book out to be published. The point is, it means to finish it. So you're gonna finish it or polish it. These are the very last steps to make it as good as it possibly can be. So it's like if you're if you're getting dressed and you wanna you wanna look extra nice, some days you would do a little more, right? You would check your hair one more time before you leave the house or look if there's any um, scuffs on your shoes or something like that if you care about that sort of thing. But the point is you're just polishing it up. So at this point is when writers will give something a title, they'll make sure they followed all the directions their teacher gave, they'll make sure it looks neat um, on the paper and that's polishing and then you can feel proud of what you've done um, and you can turn it in. Okay, or share it with somebody or even just save it for yourself because ultimately writing is for you. Okay, it's your voice on the page. Um, so it's nothing to um, run away from and it's nothing to dread. It's just a chance for you to talk, but on paper. That's all. Okay. So, um, Thank you for your attention today. Um, you might want to come back or just view this in pieces. I probably should have said that in the beginning because there's a lot going on here. But um, 
I hope that you'll try writing poetry, that you'll try some of the genres that I mentioned today, um, that you'll know that poetry is everywhere, um, that poetry is more than just feelings. Um, so if you read my bio below, you'll see that um, I have a master's degree in poetry. So um, I, I studied poetry and studied ancient poetry and, and learned a lot about it. There's a lot more to it. Um, it's been around um, as long as people have. It really has. And so um, it can bring us a lot of joy in our lives and um, it can uplift others. It can help us express our sadness. Um, it can help us create um, escape. It can help us comment on things that make us angry or things we want to change. Or it can just comment on something really beautiful. It can be funny. It can be fun. So um, I hope that you will um, take all that into consideration as you write your poetry. And um, I wish you many years of good poems. All right, so thank you um, for your time today, and I hope that you'll all keep writing poetry.